Good evening, everybody. Um, just a few notes in order to be able to start this meeting um, before we go ahead. Welcome to the meeting of the Skills, Economy and Growth Scrutiny Commission here in Hackney Council, to all our guests in our virtual meeting room and to everyone watching online. Uh, just a reminder of a few housekeeping issues before we go any further. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed now. If anyone is virtual, um, uh, I think we have um, a couple of people joining us virtually. Can you please keep your microphones on mute throughout the meeting? This will prevent audio feedback. You are still, if you're still getting feedback, please turn off any nearby devices. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand to get my attention. Uh, state your name and affiliation before you make a comment. Uh, the chat function, which some people who are online will be using, must not be used to have conversations with other participants or to provide personal information. All chat is recorded. Please only use the chat function to alert me that you wish to speak, to raise points of order, or to report technical problems. This is a formal meeting of Hackney Council. Please note the press may be in attendance. The rights of the press and public to record and film this meeting will apply. So that's the housekeeping. Now we'll move on to the body of the meeting. I would like to welcome everybody, including our guests and our officers, uh, to the meeting. I'm Polly Billington. I'm councillor in De Beauvoir Ward and chair of the commission. Um, you will be uh, familiar with the agenda which is in front of you. I'm going to start with introductions and apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence, Tracy, from the members? We don't. Uh, and we don't have any apologies for lateness. I think we have a warning of one, don't we? Councillor Walker? He should be here by now. OK, we're expecting him shortly. Guests and officers, um, just to alert people that previously we were, were going to run, um, have the um, item number four, the library strategy and restructure update. We have postponed this item uh, until, the, uh, until later on. And so we were going to bring forward the uh, planning policy, net zero and existing buildings to earlier in the meeting. So we'll be starting that uh, very shortly. So are there any urgent items or, and, or order of business before we go on? Sorry? Yes, as I, as I pointed out, the item four on the agenda has been postponed. The trade unions have asked for the opportunity to present their members' views in response to the update about the staffing restructure and delivery of the new library strategy. So this item will be referred as a work programme suggestion for the new municipal year for consideration by the new Scrutiny Commission appointed by full council in May 2024. Um, do we have any declarations of interest with regard to this agenda item? Oh, the agenda tonight. Okay, thank you. So we will move directly from item four to item five, which is why we have so many guests and so forth. So I'd like to just introduce this item, please. Um, we are uh, going to work from now until half past eight at the very, very latest. I'm quite strict at timekeeping, but we have more time than we would normally have this evening. However, um, everybody has homes to go to and scrutiny does not have to take long. It just has to be done properly. So the chair, um, we have, uh, as you are aware, we have declared a climate emergency in Hackney and we are determined according to our manifesto that we were elected on in 2022 uh, well, that we are determined to be able to meet those requirements. Um, there are increasingly important low carbon and net zero requirements in the built environment um, in a planning context. The Scrutiny Commission decided to explore what is possible for heritage buildings and conservation areas and how Hackney Council can and will use its borough planning powers to nudge retrofitting for existing and heritage buildings owned by the council and private landlords. The purposes of this item is to explore if Hackney's planning policy will support the executive to achieve their manifesto commitment to climate change in relation to retrofitting existing buildings. So the information tonight will cover the following. We have Westminster Council, who will provide information about the work of the retrofit task group, use of planning legislation, partnerships, and innovative approaches being trailed through the task group. 
We also have Hackney Council, who will provide information about their lead borough work with London Councils on the action plan for the low carbon development work stream. Hackney's built in environment, use of planning powers, the changes they need to do more, and how Hackney is integrating with wider regional and partnership work. We're also lucky enough to have Lynch Architects who will provide information about a local project in Hackney. They will give an overview of the project, project proposals, scope, and their experience of the local planning process. Unfortunately, Historic England are unable to be with us in person tonight, but have provided information about the role of heritage to support climate change. And that presentation is in the agenda pack. Historic England's emerging climate change guidance and their advice on retrofitting uh, historic buildings is also in there. It's important to note for the Commission's purposes that they are happy to take written qu questions and will provide written answers. It's disappointing that they're not here because I think some of the things that they would say we'd want to be able to um, uh, throw back to um, Hackney, but we will see whether we can achieve what we want to achieve anyhow. So we have uh, then after those presentations, um, we will uh, have. Uh, a Q&A. So I'm going to give 10 minutes to each of the presentations, so 10 minutes to Westminster City Council, 10 minutes to the London Borough of Hackney, and 10 minutes to Lynch Architects in that order. Um, but firstly, uh, I would like to welcome our guests to the meeting now. I'm afraid I can't recognise people because I don't know you and I haven't got cheat sheet. So you might have to just raise your hands when I say your name so that I know who to ask for next steps. Lauren Shevils is the lead, hello Lauren, is the lead retrofit innovation and delivery officer at Westminster City Council. And then we have Tom Burke. Hi Tom, who's head of design, conservation and sustainability at Westminster City Council. Then we have Rachel Elliott. Hello Rachel, who's from Lynch Architects. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for being here. And the London Borough of Hackney, we have people I do know, that's a bit easier. Uh, Councillor Guy Nicholson. And who's the deputy mayor and cabinet member for delivery, inclusive economy and regeneration, in which obviously planning sits. Natalie Broughton, who is the assistant director of planning and building control, and Adam Dyer, who is a principal conservation and design officer. Thank you very much for being here. I'd like to start actually just to invite Natalie um, from London Borough of Hackney to give an introduction before we commence the presentations. Is that all right? Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Natalie Browson. I'm the Assistant Director for Planning and Building Control at Hackney. Uh, and I'm really pleased to bring this important item to the Skills, Economy and Growth Scrutiny meeting this evening. Um, so we have a, a collection of presentations tonight that seek to show how we can preserve our built heritage and respond positively to the challenges of climate change. Uh, so as the chair mentioned, um, within the report pack, we have the slide deck from Historic England, um, which provides an overview of the common misconceptions regarding retrofitting heritage buildings, um, as well as those details of the emerging guidance that they're preparing. Just like to say that um, partnership working and learning from others is a key aspect of the work that we do within the planning service. So I'm delighted that we've got colleagues here from Westminster City Council um, to tell you about the work that they are doing. Um, obviously, following that presentation, as the chair said, we'll have a presentation from my colleague, um, Adam, um, who will tell you about the work that we're doing in Hackney. It's worth noting that climate change and heritage objectives do not need to be competing objectives. In Hackney, around 80% of applications for low carbon measures, such as solar panels, on listed buildings are approved. And where applications have not been acceptable, alternative ways to improve carbon efficiency of buildings can be found. And historic buildings are sources of embodied carbon. The reuse, refurbishment and retrofit of existing buildings rather than their dem demolition can optimize embodied carbon. The longer we use our existing buildings for, the less carbon needs to be emitted through the construction of new buildings. 
Um, and then finally, this evening, to illustrate Hackney's proactive approach to working with applicants, we have um, Lynch Architects here to present a real-life case study where Hackney's conservation officers and Historic England have worked collaboratively to find ways to successfully retrofit a Grade 2 star listed building at 195 Mare Street. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. I'd like to uh, invite Lauren Sheffields from Westminster City Council to um, speak. You all right there, Lauren? Yeah, can I check that everyone can hear me? Um, Tom and I are actually going to do a bit of a double act, if that's okay. That's absolutely fine. Just a warning, mm -hmm. it's it's 10 minutes past seven now, according okay. to my laptop. So um, we will. I'll give you a sort of minute warning at 19 minutes past seven. That would be brilliant. We're going to whiz through the first part of the presentation and get, get through to the meteor stuff at the end, I think. So if you could start on slide three, please, Tracy. Yeah. So what is the task force? The Retrofit Task Force is Council's project team who drives strategic retrofit initiatives to meet our citywide 2040 net zero target. The task force was created to address the practical challenges of retrofitting Westminster's vast building stock, including many heritage buildings. Next slide, please. The Council declared a climate emergency in, in 2019, launching an action plan in the same year. Of the five key themes, our work falls predominantly in ensuring that we have efficient buildings. Next slide, please. Buildings in Westminster contribute to 86% of the borough's emissions. This includes commercial properties, council-owned housing and residential buildings. It's really important to note that the Council will not be able to achieve its net zero target without a consolidated citywide approach to retrofit. Next slide, please. So what is the task force? Again, established in 2022, the task force developed an early delivery plan with complementary and innovative work streams aimed at perceived barriers to upscale delivery at a systemic level. Next slide, please. The retrofit task force is comprised of council officers, of which Tom and I exist, external stakeholders, and three independent industry experts, Sarah Edmonds, Alex Whitcroft, and Nicholas Heath. Next slide, please. This is just a diagram um, to show our supporting governance structure, both internally at Westminster City Council and externally with Innovate UK, which is our external funding partner. I'll hand over to Tom. Next slide, please. So just to tell you a little bit about the funding arrangements that we've set up for the task force. Initially, the task force was set up as a result of the climate emergency um, declaration and action plan that Westminster prepared um, and that set aside a reserve climate emergency reserve for some initiatives that the action plan had identified one of which was the task force so we started off with that reserve um, but to be honest with you it was very much business as usual what officers could do in addition to the day job so to speak um, but we were able to appoint the industry experts to help us stimulate some ideas around um, what, what the task force could do, what actions we could take. Um, during the course of last year, early last year, we were made aware of the uh, UK Innovate UK Net Zero Living um, programme, and so we made a bid for that. Um, it was fortunate that our task force had already started to map out a, a series of work streams, and the programme and the funding was very much aimed at non-technical barriers to retrofit and our work streams very much aligned with that so we made the bid and we were successful in getting um a, a good a good amount of money to support the retrofit task force and part of the program as a two-year uh, program was uh, it enabled us to uh, secure an officer to work solely on the work of the task force and lovely to say lauren was we were able to appoint lauren back in october and um very much then picked it up so as opposed to where it was before where it was officers within my team, the design team, uh, conservation team, doing it between the day job. Uh, it was now, now Lauren is just 100% working on the task force work. So uh, next slide. Um, this is a bit about the bid. We, I mean, obviously you can leave this with your provide further if you have got any questions about it, but it basically, it, it sort of sets out how our the initial work streams, the initial sort of grounding that we'd done allowed us to make the bid and it aligned with the, um, the grant programme's objectives. Next slide. And again, there's a governance structure associated with this. So Innovate UK are uh, sort of the, where the money's coming from. There's a whole cohort of 
fast of uh, fast followers who are other local authorities who are in, in the program is about 50 uh, 30 30 and they they themselves in UK have a whole support network to help that cohort deliver their programs across the country next slide uh, so I'm going to quickly take you through the five work streams that we have. So under the five key work streams, the, ret the Retrofit Task Force seeks to accelerate our retrofit delivery in Westminster. Next slide, please. The first work stream is an archetype approach in procurement club. Um, over the next 12 months, the task force are looking to create a retrofit procurement club, which will allow building owners to aggregate demand and potentially share costs based on criteria related to the archetype of their building. The procurement club can work to deliver higher quality retrofit in a more efficient and effective manner through using roadmaps and connecting stock owners to trusted tradespeople. Next slide, please. The second work stream is planning policy and process. The task force recognizes that there are numerous policy levers that we can use to accelerate retrofit. As such, we've been working closely with our policy team at Westminster City Council, and this includes running a collaborative policy workshop where the industry experts that I showed you previously were consulted on emerging retrofit policy. Um, the planning policy work stream also will optimize existing planning processes, which we'll come on to in more detail in a second. Next slide, please. The third work stream is partnership pilot projects and case studies. Um, and this sees some of the previous initiatives set out as potential pilot projects, whether that's based on archetypes, place-based approaches, or trialing innovative planning consents. Next slide, please. The fourth work stream, mutual and collaborative stewardship, seeks to implement radical step change solutions by sharing knowledge with other retrofit groups and local authorities. As such, the task force actively attends and feeds into national bodies and pan-London organisations, such as the National Retrofit Hub and Retrofit London, which is led by London councils. Next slide, please. An important roundup of all of the five work streams is to, is to ensure that it's communicated effectively. So the council needs to demonstrate a dynamic approach to evolving policy and guidance by communicating these findings to a wider audience. Secondary to this, under our proposed training initiatives, we also want to ensure that our own council officers are skilled up on retrofit. And this includes both the decision makers and the officers leading on uh, retrofit delivery. Next slide. Um, so I think the area might be particularly interesting was around planning policy and um, planning process and how one might use that to uh, uh, lead to, to drive retrofit. Um, and particularly with Westminster, we've got a quite a very um, heritage rich city, uh, 11,000 listed buildings over over nearly 80% of our uh, area is conservation area. So uh, one of the things we did with our industry experts, they did a challenge paper, which was around a whole series of why can't you do this? Why couldn't you do that? Almost kind of a, an external perspective on, 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 on planning issues. And that was a really useful exercise. And there was a lot of it. So we took, we called it a challenge paper. This is just a street, uh, screen grab from one section. It was, it was pages and pages of things. And it was just looking at how one might do planning differently slightly to incentivize and encourage retrofit. So that was like planning processes. Could you just make guidance easier for people who are making a simple application who rarely engage with the planning system? How do they, how can they get through it as easily as possible? Can you do that through validation? Can you do that through simplifying or helping them understand how to fill in the right bits of a form? But also there are lots of stuff in existing legislation that we could use for for retrofit which haven't been used so there's local listed building consent orders which KNC have started to do with their PV panels and windows uh, heritage partnership agreements um, and local development orders so those are sort of permissions and consent regimes which you could exploit to essentially if, if planning is perceived as anything like a barrier to to retrofit then let's try and remove some of those barriers where we can all at the same time acknowledging that a lot of this stuff can be done so that um, retrofit and protecting the historic environment can be done com as a complementary exercise. Next slide. You've got one minute. Uh, so we've got a new retrofit policy that's being developed, which is very much aimed at, um, uh, it's more about protecting um, 
uh, taking a retrofit first approach to whether you dem demolish or redevelop, but it's also incentivizing retrofit. So the wording of that is emerging. Uh, next slide. And Queen's Park State, we can talk about this further, but this is an area which we might look to introduce a local development order to allow certain works which would normally require planning permission not to need planning permission. Next slide. And I'm going to whiz through the uh, partnership pilot project. So we are looking at doing heritage partnership agreements also um, with external stakeholders such as the Howard Deward in the state. So part of that was um, commencing a literature review around how um, to implement heritage partnership agreements. Um, Historic England actually has a great piece of guidance about how you set one up, which we've used um, in initial conversations with Howard Deward. And, um, they're looking to retrofit a large area of their building stock, which includes a lot of grade listed buildings. Um, and by doing this HPA with uh, Howard de Warden, instead of a number of listed building consents, for example, it's going to benefit both the council and the estate by streamlining this planning policy process. Next slide, please. Other emerging pilot projects for heritage partnership agreements include the council's own building stock. So housing officers have mapped out the retrofit delivery plan by establishing which estates were due for major works or innovation. And initially the task force was approached by housing officers to reduce planning application response times. But when we were presented with the plan, we soon realized that there was scope to pilot heritage partnership agreements with our own housing officers in house for the grade two listed Churchill Gardens on screen. Um, the last slide is perhaps less relevant, but just to show that we're also piloting low carbon en energy suppliers as well. Um, uh, engineer in our team, Paolo Bellici, went to a demonstrated project at Richmond Council to look at graphene heating, and now we're looking to implement it on our Lesson Green estate. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was brilliant and only slightly over time, which is perfect. Um, any questions for of clarification or information at this stage from the Commission? We will go, we will dig deeper once we've heard from Hackney and from the architects. It's all quite clear. Can I be clear that um, this is a, this is one about the, uh, about the funding and the, the nature of the project. How much are you getting different permissions because you are being funded by Innovate UK to do this than most councils? Or are you simply being funded to do what everyone can do, but just more so? Sorry, it doesn't make any difference to the number of applications or the, the number of proposals, if you like. But what it what it allows us to do, which I don't think we would do or be able to do, is to explore these avenues of can we can we can we deliver a local development order for the whole of uh, you know a part of the city? Could we do heritage partnership agreements with our housing officers? I think we could do them, but it would probably drag out over a lot longer period to actually do it whereas um the funding has enabled us to prioritize these works as opposed to them being something we do alongside the rest of so this is a this is a, an example of how you might have powers but they're pretty theoretical unless you've got the resource it's um uh, yes i mean it's theoretical it can be done um and maybe and and part of the stewardship thing we talked about is maybe if we can demonstrate how you do it we can help other authorities to say right there's a blueprint for how we can replicate it so it might in doing it we might be sort of a bit kind of um leading the way a bit in some strands of it which might help others then because that's part of the stewardship thing is to be to be as collaborative and knowledge share as possible on these yeah things. i noticed that in this presentation that was great any other questions of information or clarification gilbert Thanks, yeah. Just a quick one on the uh, local development orders. Um, can you choose any area that you want to, to, to kind of use for that? Or is it specific? Or my, my question is actually conservation areas. Can you use it in conservation areas? Which, which system? The, uh, the local development orders. Yeah, you, well, basically local development order is a uh, an order which means that you're granting a local permitted development. So something that couldn't normally be done under PD um, can be done because you've set that order. So with the Queen's Park Estate that I talked about, we've restricted PD in that whole area. That's a big, massive big conservation area. And the main thing that's uh, that people are a bit frustrated about is uh, we've 
uh, restricted PD on the replacement of windows. And of course, everybody wants to have double glazing and we're supportive of them having double glazing in, in the conservation area buildings. Um, and the local development order, essentially, if we can get it working, is if you install windows like this, double glazed windows like this, not PVC, timber, um, you don't need to come to us for planning permission. So you don't need to pay for the planning application fee. You don't need to get an architect to prepare drawings for us. If you do it like that, you don't need to, it's PD. Whereas at the moment, if they want to replace their windows, they need to come, they need to make a planning application every single time. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'd like to move on, if that's all right, and welcome Adam Dyer from Hackney Council. Uh, Adam, you've got 10 minutes. Can it's, I it's, share my presentation instead of that one, as mine's a bit shorter, as I'm conscious. Yes, I'm sure um, is that okay yeah, that's you? a technical question that I'll have to refer to Tracy, because you'll know better than me where it's possible. Yes, it is. It's 25 past seven, so we've got until 25 to eight. Thank you, Adam. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so we're going to run through five parts, looking at Hackney's built environment, what is retrofitting, our relationship with the GLA, our emerging work, and our suggested ways forward as a response. Can you get a bit closer to the microphone? I'll get oh, the microphone is that better? closer is that better? to you. Yeah, that would be great, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so our typologies in Hackney, 55.2% roughly of Hackney's buildings are your historic or traditionally constructed, i.e. pre-1919. These are the ones that we often think about as heritage buildings. You know, probably about half of these are within a conservation area. We've got 35 conservation areas in Hackney, of which that's about a third of the borough. We've got 1,300 listed buildings and 470 locally listed buildings. Our listed buildings make up about 2.8% of all buildings in Hackney. And what is retrofitting? I'm just going to run this through to ensure that we're all on the same page with it. And this is the Letty sets out this framework on suggested approach. So principle one is reducing energy consumption, prioritizing occupant health and building, a whole building retrofit plan, and then you measure the performance. So it's not just a matter of doing the work, it's going back and checking it consistently to ensure that it's behaving as it should do, and then considering, considering the impact on embodied carbon by doing this work. And there are different retrofit approaches, a tailored one, more constrained things such as heritage buildings, and all other homes as well, which is an unconstrained approach. The retrofit plan encourage you to think about buildings holistically. So it's not about doing one individual retrofit measure. It's about looking at it as a whole. So is this, can I do more? Can I, if I do one element, will it harm something else? So it's about having that entire plan. And planning makes up this stage that you can see on just here. If you can see my mouse moving, planning makes up this stage just here. So it's a very, very, very small part of a whole house retrofit plan. And what needs permission is always this bit of a grey area. Unlisted buildings outside of a conservation area can do what they want internally, and they've got an awful lot of permitted development rights to do a lot of retrofitting work without any engagement with a local planning authority. Within a conservation area, they can do anything they want internally. Some external work would need planning permission, such as changing your windows, external wall insulation, but an awful lot can be done under permitted development rights subject to a meeting that criteria. Listed buildings are a bit more constrained where internal and external alterations need listed building consent, but there aren't any hard and fast rules. It all depends on the special interest of that building. So there's no automatically you can't retrofit, you can't do double glazing. It's this case by case basis to ensure that that special interest is preserved. Our relationship with the GLA as well. So we've got our national planning policy framework set out by the government. Beneath that, we have the London plan where they've got two policies which kind of largely cover retrofitting. They don't cover retrofitting as much as a local plan would cover. And I think Sadiq Khan released a letter earlier this summer last year saying that that's a local planning authority to deal with smaller scale retrofitting. It's not up for him. He's more strategic level applications. Um, and our local plan has a policy on mitigating climate change as well. And I'm going to run through what Hackney Council is doing with our emerging work program and things that we have planned in the future. So we've got our London Council program, and Hackney is leading on the low carbon development. They all interlink together a certain amount of these programs. So although one council may be leading on one, all of the work has so much crossovers, for example, retrofitting. 
links into low carbon development, it links into retrofit London, it links into resilient and green. So although one council may be leading on it, all the councils are working together. Our focus on low carbon development, you know, across the London programme, we've led it for the last two years, we're now leading on it with Karen Herring Bay for the next two years. The aim is to collaborate, to encourage collaboration on policy making and guidance to ensure that each individual council isn't making the same guidance, so that where it is possible to share, it is shared. Uh, monitor to ensure low carbon buildings are being created. Uh, use innovation as well, share new technology, share community engagement guidance when it's, when it's released and increase training and understanding within all councils, let's say by upskilling the people that work there. Our local carbon development toolkit was launched in November 2023. And this is that kind of summary of all documents, all best practice that each council are doing can be found in this document. And the aim is that it's a living document. So when we find examples, it continues to grow. So it's not just a document, you know, preserved in aspect. Our website, we are aiming this spring to be much more clear about what retrofitting can be done to buildings. There is always this confusion that you can't retrofit a heritage building. That's that's never really the case, but it's getting over that myth. And so by updating the website to make it really, really, really clear what people can do, how they can approach local authorities with free apps to engage, to ensure that they aren't going to get an application that's turned away, you can work through it. Uh, we're also creating a new revised extension alterations SPD you know, a third of the document at the start is going to focus on retrofit. And the idea of including it within this document is that when you are making alterations, when you are extending your house, you first think about retrofit. Other councils have got their own standalone retrofit documents, but in our view, that didn't work quite so well because it shouldn't be seen as something that's separate from the process. It's all part of that. So the aim is for public consultation in summer 2024, and we'll be reaching out to members in the next month or so to set up workshops to get your views on this too. We're also conducting a conservation area review program. It's a fairly ambitious program, um, which we aim to do two to three appraisals a year, where you're working to ensure that retrofitting can be intertwined with the management plan. So areas that you're picking out as being significant and areas that you can say can change, the management plan can go, you know, lots of render in this area, external wall insulation is a possibility, and you'd advocate for it. So it's really clear for people living in these areas where they can be viewed as more constrained, where you're giving that proactive guidance. ACAN, there's a document here, gave a great deal of information about last and they've got this kind of martyr toolkit. We're not going quite as far as them, but that's very resource intensive. Uh, we're also working internally with people like Hackney Light and Power. The aim is that we're not working in silos across the council, that we're not say, giving grants for um, solar panels on listed buildings, but they're not being able to do it. So we're working with them throughout the process. We've approved them on Hackney Empire, the grade two star building just next to us, and that's been installed. They're being installed at the Marble Lab on Newington Green any day now. And we've currently got two applications in, one would be down and engagement with Hackney, perhaps for Haggerston School at the moment, both which are grade two listed. All of this work is also funded by the Carbon Offset Fund, which is we're also working with Housing Retrofit Strategy. They got 4.5 million last year for their, and their social housing decarbonization fund, where we're developing a typology approach to ensure that we can clearly say that in you know, a Victorian building, this is how it could be retrofit. And the aim is to use that typology approach to set out clearer kind of planning case studies in the future to kind of help demystify the process and show what can be done when you think about things holistically. We're at the scoping stage for local listed building consent orders to figure out how it can work for Hackney. Hackney is of incredibly varied list of building stock. It is, you know, it's very different to, let's say, Islington, where you've got much more uniformity in their building typologies, and same with RBKC. So we're currently figuring out how this could work, such as it could work successfully for double glazing. I'm just developing that at the moment. Our suggested ways forward include, this isn't happening at the moment, but a regional approach to retrofitting guides rather than each council developing it, either developed through the London councils or through the GLA, because, um, a regional approach works so much better than a national approach so with, the, with the design guide because the impacts of climate change are going to impact the regions very differently. Um, actually having shared guides to disseminate knowledge better so each local planning authority again isn't creating their own work, Historic England's doing something, Historic Scotland's doing something else, So much much more shared collaboration and kind of bigger thinking at an earlier stage rather than individual smaller grants for each council to do their own guidance. Um, and a joined up thinking across the sector, i.e. planning, for example, makes up oops, a 
a tiny part of this process, as you can see on the screen, but there's so much more, there's so much more linkage that could be developed at an earlier stage. And there needs to be much more professional knowledge. And it's recognized that each year we need 16,000 16, new full-time equivalent workers to work on retrofitting. Hackney alone needs 570 to meet that retrofitting demand, let alone much bigger than planning. There physically isn't enough people to do it. And clearer baselines to ensure that building regs can encourage retrofitting in the right way to ensure there is that level of upgrading for residential buildings as well. So when applications and alterations come forward to them, they can be forced to make retrofitting changes rather than it's a want or desire or maintaining the status quo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Any questions of informational clarification for Adam? Adam, can I just, could you just refer back to that last slide? Yes. And there's the AECB retrofit and benefit standards. There's no regulatory framework to incentivize retrofit and only voluntary third party certification exists. So this means that it's not enforceable by councils to say you have to do retrofit when in, in any building applications. I think for minor applications, that's correct. Minor applications. Yes. Yeah. You might know better on this, Tom. Do we need it on majors as well? NFIT standards? We can't force that for minors. Can we force it for major applications? Yes. Could you put your microphone on, please, Tom? You potentially could. I think if you were granting a planning permission and one of the benefits of why you were approving it was to secure a, an energy performance, you could put a uh, in the same way that major applications might need to make meet a BRIAM standard, you could probably put, put, impose a condition requiring performance to a yeah, to benefit is another metric that's a measurable metrics to. But it's hard for councils to use these voluntary frameworks, and um, that that's the message I'm getting. Well, I think benefit is is a is a is a is is a well established uh, accreditation methodology so you know if you get an NFIT accredited uh, somebody who can accredit an NFIT installation then it it gets signed off as such so we wouldn't do it but they would have to demonstrate so an app would have to submit their confirmation that they they got that standard in the same way with Briam or something but like. you couldn't require it I'm sorry to to labor this point but the my clear understanding is that is this, if there's no current minimum requirement for retrofit in building regs these kind of standards are things that people can come and say, look, we're registered, and you can go, oh, that's marvellous, gavel through. But you can't require people to do that when they put a planning application in for any building work. No, so if somebody came in for a rear extension or a roof extension, you can't say you must you must build this to benefit standard. I suppose what I was saying is if somebody comes along and says, I want to do a great retrofit scheme, and by the way, I also want this slightly controversial rear extension then you might sort of on balance say we, we're happy to approve this scheme on the balance that we're getting this fantastic retrofit scheme and then you could condition that they must deliver it to that standard okay thank you that's very helpful uh, any other further questions for clarification no okay well let's go to rachel elliott from lynch architects who is here rachel it's uh 22 minutes to eight so you have 10 minutes great thank you very much for inviting us to come and speak to you this evening about 195 mayor street um we're a local hackney based firm of architects and we have lots of experience working on historic buildings and also on new buildings in historic settings next please so as natalie said this is a live case study we submitted planning and listed building consent last november and the decision is due um towards the end of this month it's a very prominent historic grade two star listed building on Mare Street. Um, and it had been abandoned and on the heritage at risk register for many years. Um, and although it's early days on the project, I think it's useful to look at this project in the context of decarbonizing historic building stock. Um, if it's possible on this kind of building, then it should be possible anywhere. Next. So the house fronts onto Mare Street and the site is roughly parallel to London Fields um, overground station. Next, please. Uh, it's pretty faint on the slide here, but the proposed site plan shows the arrangement of the house with gardens to the front and rear. Next. 
It's a very distinguished symmetrical street frontage um, that's now hemmed in on all sides, a three-story building with a lower ground floor. Um, next. The plot to the, to the rear was recently redeveloped. Um, a four-story block of 21 flats was built, resulting in the house being heavily overlooked. Next. The interiors are a mixture of historic remnants of panelled rooms, historic doorways and fireplaces, and expanses of bland plastered walls and rooms that have been knocked together. Next. Um, here are some more views of the interiors. This is the first floor. Next, please. And the second floor. Next, please. In the basement. Um, there are original York stone flags at the lower ground floor level, as well as historic doors, wall linings, and a very old kitchen range. Next. Um, I'll just give you a very brief part of the history of the site. We, we do know quite a lot about the site at the house and its occupants. Um, it dates back to 1697. The house was built in the then rural outskirts of the city for Abraham Dollins, a merchant from Ghent. It was subsequently owned by two other merchants and in 1852 was sold to the Elizabeth Fry Society to be used as a refuge for the reformation of women prisoners. This use continued for over 50 years, when in 1913 it was sold and became the New Lansdowne Working Man's Club. In the 1920s, the house was extended to incorporate a large concert hall at the rear and major internal alterations and opening up took place. The Home Guard occupied the house during World War II and it was bombed in 1940. The club shut in 2004 and the house was owned by a series of developers. It was also squatted at various points and squatters held community events and performances and parties there. And when the land to the rear was developed for housing, the house itself was earmarked for office use. But perhaps if it had been identified for residential use at this stage, the development might not have allowed to encroach um, so close. Next, please. Our clients, um, Elizabeth Petrasco and Duncan Clark, purchased the building in 2022 with the intention to convert it back into its original use as a house for them and their family. And in March 23, Hackney Council granted approval for the building to be converted into a dwelling with community arts use at lower ground floor um, with a sui generis use class. The consented scheme prepared by Rhys Bolter Architects included some internal alterations, an unpopular external escape stair, a small outbuilding, landscaping, and the replacement of the front boundary and, um, gates and railings. Next, please. Whilst this consent established the principles of the change of use back to residential, the scheme lacked detail and a clear strategy for the rehabilitation of the house. Next, please. Lynch Architects were approached by the clients in February to develop proposals. Our scheme seeks to um, amplify the special atmosphere of the house, responding to the remnants of original historic fabric and bringing legibility back to the interior and exterior spaces with a series of sensitive interventions. The project will embody an ethical conservation approach to energy and heritage. And we're working with a very strong design team, including Price and Myers Structural Engineers and Max Fordham's um, Energy um, Environmental Engineers. Energy efficient measures and low carbon technologies proposed in the retrofit will assist in bringing down heating costs to a more manageable level in the longer term making it more likely that a single family could actually afford realistically to, to live in the house. So next, please. Just a quick overview of the proposed scope of works. Um, next, please. We've designed a formal and richly planted front garden. The area to the north of the house gives access to the community arts center. Um, and the rear garden is a private um, courtyard for the family. Um, and attempts to deal with overlooking by introducing a series of walls and layers of planting. Next one. Um, the plan showing the front and side gardens. Next, please. We've introduced a central arch gateway, emphasizing the symmetrical character of the house. Next. And we've tested these collage, collage tested the proposals with collages and, and models. Next. Um, the clients commissioned a mural on the adjacent blank elevation by the Brazilian artist Tiago Matza, which relates to the botanical history of the neighbourhood. Um, the Lodges nursery was located very close on the nursery. Next, please. Um, it's pretty hard to see this, but you can, we've sort of walked up the existing condition where you look through the front door, through the back door, and you can see the 
flats very close behind by introducing a series of um, walls and thresholds at the back. We've kind of created a lead and less overlooked um, con condition. Next, please. I'm just gonna, if I can just ask you to skip through these rear garden um, images quickly so that we can get onto the kind of low energy measures. Next. Next. And next, please. Um, instead of the external fire escape tower previously proposed, we are going to meet the fire regulations with a new internal freestanding timber stair. There is evidence to suggest that a second servant stair would have originally existed in the position that we've shown. Um, next. Uh, next, please. Next. This is just some close up drawings of the new stair. Next. The, intervent, the insertion of walls into locations where they likely existed in the past, making more cellular do domestic spaces, is considered by planning officers as a heritage benefit since the building will revert towards its historic floor plan. Um, next. I'm just going to ask you to flick through these internal images. Um, proposed new timber panelling takes its cues from the historic panelling, and we have a develop strategies for how to deal with the historic paintwork so that we can keep um, large sections of the most valuable. Um, we propose also to improve the, some of the proportional relationships of inside the house. Um, next. Next, please. And next. <laughs> next. Um, I think I'll just go straight on to the planning process here. So our proposals have been developed following a pre-application meeting last May with Adam Dyer and Catherine Nicholl of Hackney Council and Claire Brady of Historic England. We received a response letter in July with an in-principle support for the proposed scheme and a second pre-app meeting was held in October. We incorporated recommendations into the revised proposals that were submitted for planning. And we also discussed the importance of producing detailed internal drawings for um, the listed building application in order to agree a strategy on a room by room basis. Next, please. So the energy strategy, um, Historic England's recent advice note, climate change and historic building adaptation, which was published for consultation in November, helpfully identifies broad strategies for improving energy efficiency, um, which are likely to be acceptable in listed buildings. And I think it's the first document that so explicitly sets those out, um, being mindful of impact on significance. And happily, the strategies that they outline echo our thinking. Our fabric first approach and low energy servicing strategy has been developed in response to the opportunities and constraints presented by the building and the site. And we prioritize the avoidance of fossil fuel to promote the long-term decarbonization and improvement in air quality. Next. Right, we have one minute. Oh, no. The energy strategy prepared by Max Fordham's is structured according to the London plan energy hierarchy, be lean, be clean, and be green. And just to summarize, um, the first step obviously is to reduce energy demands and We've introduced a number of passive measures um, to improve the thermal performance of the fabric, also in improving air tightness. And um, next, we intend to replace the recently installed single glazing with high performing double glazing and to insulate external walls and roof with breathable materials um, where possible. On the ground floor, we're proposing to insert breathable insulation inside the existing void between the timber paneling and the external walls. And on next, on upper floors, we're proposing specific solutions depending on what the existing substrate of the external walls is. Um, overall, we're using MVHR, introducing um, uh, a much kind of lower energy demand into the building. And this is expected to result in a reduction of the yearly heating demand of, by 77%. If you could just go to the next slide, and probably move on. We are looking at introducing um, um, an air source heat pump and also um, underfloor heating where it's possible in the most sensitive historic rooms, um, and then natural or fan-assisted radiators elsewhere. 
next. Um, we're also um, using two forms of renewable technology, the air source heat pumps and, the, and photovoltaics. So air source heat pumps are a highly efficient method of heating and cooling a building, far more efficient than a gas boiler. Um, and electrification of heating also ensures that as the national grid decarbonizes, so does the building. Uh, the PVs um, should, have, we've run tests on how much saving that should, um, we, that basically the calculations have been made that by using this array of 30 meters squared, we can offset um, 1.2 tons of CO2 per annum. So overall combined, next please, the measures um, represent a carbon saving of 90% compared to the existing building if we were to assume that it was heated by a gas boiler. So just very, very quickly to conclude, the strategy at Mayor Street could be described as um, long-term sustainable conservation and should provide a robust basis for future stewardship. The proposals put forward here represent a significant financial commitment to keeping the building off the heritage at risk register and rehabilitating it as a family home, whilst also providing valuable community use and access for the general public. Our clients are enthusiastic to share with others the stories and the atmosphere of the house and help to write the next chapter in its history. Thank you. Sorry for Thank you very much, Rachel. I'm much appreciated. Um, anybody who's got any questions of clarification or information before we open up, up to wider questions and answers? Um, Councillor Gill, Councillor Smith, and then Councillor Potter. Councillor Smith. This, I know this building, and it's a, it's a really exciting project. I'm sure you're really excited about it. I mean, I'm excited about it. Um, I just wanted to talk about the chimneys, because um, I, I counted, I think, nine chimney stacks that I could see in the photograph. What are you doing about open fireplaces? We're not going to have open fires. We're going to use the chimneys, actually, as the route for the MVHR. So the ventilation strategy will have heat recovery within it, and each room will be fed from a concealed pipe that's hidden in the chimney. So we're currently talking about getting the chimneys cleaned and trying to assess what condition they're in in order to enable that. It has been done before by Max Fordham's at Trinity College in Cambridge. They did a quite a sort of heavy retrofit there and it worked pretty successfully because you can hide the grills sort of above the, you know, just tuck them in and um, our clients are definitely not, not interested in having open fires. So in the mouth or blocking them? Oh no, they'll, they'll be open, but they connect back into the roof space so that the MVHR can sort of connect around the whole building. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Potter. Um, again, it's really exciting project and we're really looking forward to hearing more about it and also seeing over the years the kind of monitoring that I'm sure that you're going to put in place. I mean, the U values coming down to the walls um, are quite impressive given the restrictions for a listed building this time. I didn't quite get the sense of, because to bring the U values down significantly, you've got to have con continuous insulation layers. And I, I got the sense of more bits and pieces rather than this continuous you know, like layer. Am I wrong in uh, my interpretation? Or We are looking at it as a sort of whole house model in terms of how the U values are um, approached and I think we are kind of averaging out. I think in some ways you don't want to achieve too high a U value on an existing external wall because the likelihood of where, where you can't um, upgrade it you're then going to get a, a, a dew point and it could cause problems so we're actually not as ambitious on the external wall U values as we could be where we're trying to do that is where we know we've got a completely vapor permeable build up there in those areas we can we can go for it and really layer up the insulation we're using a really interesting product called diathonite which is applied as a, 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 a plaster sort of product but it has cork and rubber in it and you can layer it up in sort of 50 mil layers and it enables you to get pretty good u values but still be completely kind of vapor permeable um and again in the roof you know, places that we can do it, we, we will. Um, and always mindful, you know, not to create kind of cold bridges where we yeah. can't. So it's it will be quite tricky. It'll be challenging, especially with the air tightness. But we have to deal with it on a kind of room by room basis. And also in some of the rooms, there's 80 mil of sort of thistle coat plaster onto masonry already. So in some places, it's not 
we can't really take hack that off and start again. So we're it's yeah, we definitely have to work around the building quite carefully. Thank you very much. I'd like to open the questions out to so that the commission can ask anybody who's given presentations and indeed Councillor Nicholson questions based on what we've heard this evening, which is a combination of some very, very innovative transformation of a listed building in this uh, in this borough, a, de a developing policy in Hackney under the current rules and some uh, particular activity going on in Westminster, which has been resourced in order to be able to see if some of the current powers can be used and adopted at scale and whether other people can learn from that. So I think that's what we've, that's what we've heard. We are the Skills Economy and Growth Commission. We have responsibility for planning, but we are not living in Hackney. So much as a lot of people would love to spend a lot of time talking about residential houses and, and so forth, as though that, that's our, our priority is about how we use planning powers to retrofit our buildings in a, in, a, in a borough with a significant number of those buildings, regardless of whether they are residential or commercial, and looking, focusing specifically on regulation, legislation, finance, and technology. Because ultimately, I think what was very useful about your presentation, Adam, was it pointed to the number of people we need to be skilled to be able to do this. A lot of this is utterly theoretical unless you've got somebody who can actually do it. And I think that's some of the things we might want to talk to Rachel about. So I'm um, open up to the commission to ask questions. Um, and just a reminder, we'd like to, we've got just over half an hour. Councillor Potter and then Councillor Premery. Um, very simple question. <laughs> can you get yourself, micro uh, can you get the microphone closer to you, so please? Um, I just wondered what, you know, there's lots of great work going on, both in Hackney and in West in Westminster. And I just wonder from hearing the presentation with West Westminster and the task force and the different strands, all the, you know, resourcing aside, all the things that we can learn from the work that is going on that really stands out to you that we can think about that you're perhaps taking forward as part of your, you know, your thinking now and things that you'd like to take to take forward. Thanks, Councillor Potter. Um, if I can start to respond to that, and then Adam may want to kind of chip in. Um, absolutely, that's kind of, you know, I think I said in my introduction that kind of um, learning from others um, is a really key point of uh, a part of what we do within the planning service. I think um, our priority over the last two years um, has really been that. So um, we have in Hackney been the lead borough for the low carbon work stream for the London Council's program. Um, and that really is all about sharing information and um, good practice. Um, so um, I think that's going to you know, continue to be our focus going forward. Um, and obviously Westminster will obviously be able to, to feed into that as well. So um, what we've been doing over the last two years is, is looking at um, how we can develop a toolkit um, so that um, we can share good examples across London on um, things from policy making, um, ideas around local development orders, um, ideas around how you kind of streamline the planning process. Um, and that's across all um, measures around climate change. So it's about kind of new development and, and achieving kind of low carbon and zero carbon in new development. But part of our remit also includes retrofitting as well. Um, so I think the answer is yes, we're looking at what Westminster are doing, um, but we're also looking at what other boroughs are, are also doing. Um, the other key thing that we've been able to do is um, pool resources. So where we collectively, um, as a group, um, are identifying areas where um, there could be research or um, we could benefit from um, commissioning work, we, we can use um, money that each of the boroughs are putting in to then um, commission that piece of work. And that's really where you get kind of value for money. 
Um, so an example of that is not, not strictly on retrofit, but on the climate change theme is um, all of the boroughs kind of contributed towards looking at um, evidence to support the cost of carbon for carbon offsetting. Um, and then that then feeds into future policy making. Um, so um, going forward in terms of our work programme for, for the next two years, um, we've developed this policy tool already, which includes elements of retrofit. Um, we're looking to um, commission a, a report on um, the use of sustainable materials because there's challenges there in terms of fire risk. So looking at how we can um, uh, increase the potential around things like cross-laminated timber in construction, um, but also linking it back to this theme around retrofit. Um, one of the themes that we've identified is how we um, increase access to um, retrofit information for residents, particularly in conservation areas. And I think that that's actually something that Westminster have done really well in terms of updating their website. And that you'll see from, uh, you'll have seen from Adam's presentation that that's on our work program um, for this year, I think spring to just update our website. So um, we'll be we'll certainly looking at, uh, I think we already have done, looked at Westminster's website and how they provide that information to residents on how they can most efficiently retrofit their houses in a way or other properties in a way that um, uh, also um, kind of um, meets those heritage objectives as well. Do you want to say a few words on that? Can we hear from Councillor Premier, please? Thank you, Chair. And thank you um, both for your, uh, all, all three of you for your presentations. They were really fantastic. Apologies about the acoustics. Um, so, it was really good to hear about the um, training uh, at Westminster that your officers are getting around the retrofitting and understanding. Could you say a little bit more about um, the skills um, and training uh, that is happening um, to kind of, and, and, and how you employ the workforce? I mean, it's interesting to see the breakdown of, of what London needs as well. The, the 16,000 new full-time equivalent and, and in Hackney, the, five, uh, the 570 full-time equivalent. Um, so if you could tell us um, how you employ the workforce and also um, what the relationship is with colleges. I know there's very good work done at the University of Westminster as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, happy to take this and then Tom and I will share the answer. Um, so again, it kind of goes back to that collaborative stewardship vehicle and knowledge sharing. Um, we've got quite um, an active green skills, um, I want to say team, but I feel like Jenny Harris is just one person at the moment. It's just quite a formidable person. Um, she's leading on our green skills and economy and has created a uh, kind of a, a live working group with lots of colleges, not only within Westminster to address the skills gap, um, doing some kind of predictive work on what level of kind of reefers, retrofit installers, uh, the tradespeople that will need basically to implement the retrofit delivery work. Um, but that again is being shepherded or stewarded through this kind of collaborative vehicle that, is it uh, London? It's not London Councils, it's... Um, uh, I think it's London, yeah, London Forward. Um, but again, that was all to do with engaging um, London colleges that are actually training up people at the moment to address that skills gap. Um, what else can we say on that? Well, maybe we're also asking about within the council itself and um, training that. So, uh, within the planning service, we've um, we've organised a series of. Um, retrofit courses for all the staff to go on so they can understand retrofit issues um particularly for westminster we very much focused around um understanding it from a traditional buildings perspective which is very much like Hackney, where as adam said there's a high percentage of traditional building construction so understanding retrofit in that context but also understanding it from the context of um what can be done with um, historic buildings and buildings in conservation areas. So our own sort of conservation officers or planning officers have all gone through a series of training courses and are, we, we also, um, within my team, we've employed two sustainability officers um, who, who are more specialists around uh, energy performance and um, embodied carbon issues. But they're both um, 
they both come from the private sector and they're both very uh, knowledgeable. And so they've actually set up a program of um, training, bringing in externals to sort of give us some more insights from, from other perspectives. And then I, I would say another internal uh, group that we work closely with is our own housing colleagues. And um, uh, they are undertaking a retrofit program of all the um, uh, council estates and, um, and properties that we, uh, resident, uh, residential properties that we have and um, they're undertaking a program of, of retrofit and have actually um, expanded their team quite a lot in the last year or two to try and address not just um, the practical issues but also some of the technical issues and some of the sort of how one might scale stuff up how one might do more and so um, I think if you like bringing in a new group of people who understand the the issues um both from a technical perspective but also from a kind of how one might resource all of this so that's been quite insightful for us but i think there's an acknowledged problem that there isn't enough people who understand retrofit both you know across the board really so there is a real need to upskill um and as you touched upon as well probably the biggest challenge to retrofit is 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 financing it I was going to follow up on finance. Can I follow up on finance? Do we think, from your experience, that introducing more local listed building consent orders would create a market for retrofit sufficient to do stuff at scale that might reduce costs for um, homeowners? Well, my view is it potentially can. I think if you create an environment where the market can see there are opportunities and there isn't too much uncertainty, they're more likely to fill it and, and be interested in it. We were talking in the office today about uh, heat networks. And if, if, you know, if you were able to give confidence to people who provide and deliver heat networks, that they are going to be able to be supported and it will be acceptable, then you get that greater level of investment. So it could be a sort of virtuous circle because then you also get the, you know, more interest in developing the skills, more educational provision for all of those skills. So it could be quite a virtuous circle. And there's lots of stats around about how retrofit, you know, responsible retrofit could deliver quite huge sort of economic benefits to local areas in the country as a whole. In that context, is the local listed building consent orders that you've got sufficient or would you be looking for a different or more ambitious regulation or, or legislative change in order to be able to drive greater uptake of retrofit in these kind of buildings? So just to, just to clarify, we don't have any list of consent orders. RBKC have two and we're looking at them. Uh, possibly a bit like Adam's challenge in Hackney, the Building typologies in Westminster are a little bit more varied. And so what K and C have done is a kind of blanket LBC, local list of building consent order for um, PV panels. Whereas I think we're struggling to do a blanket approach. So ours would have to be a bit more nuanced. But as I understand it, and I, so this is, I can't furnish you with facts here, but my understanding is that, and I think probably K and C have to do a bit more analysis of the take up, but it hasn't hugely changed, shift the dial on on solar panels. But um, what it, what it, what these sort of measures are doing are trying to facilitate and remove any kind of impediment to it if, if, it, can, if it can achieve something. So I don't know if, if the solar panels one has done made a big difference. I suspect the windows one, which they've also done, might be um, more impactful. Um, uh, but again, that's quite a complex one that they've introduced. It's not straightforward. But um, I guess the answer really, or the proof of the pudding, would be in authorities that have actually done it and seeing how successful it's been. And the only authority that I'm aware of that's actually gone the whole way is KNC and Kensington and Chelsea. RBKC. Yeah, sorry. And um, and that the, the the PV one is probably about maybe two years old now and the windows one is about 12 months old so i don't know if they've got any stats or they're able to collect data on who's availed themselves of that opportunity because i don't think i thought oh no i think there is a notification process so i think maybe they are able to 
bring some stats to that at some point. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions from the Commission? Can I have Councillor Narcross, Councillor Smith, uh, Councillor Root, and then Councillor Smith? Um, yeah, thank you. I thought all those presentations were really interesting. Um, so obviously the local list of building consent orders are about kind of removing impediments and making it easier for people to, to sort of make these changes. I guess the other side of that is, is kind of what powers we have to kind of force people to make changes. And obviously I think as the answer to Councillor Billington's question was we don't really have necessarily many of those powers. I was just wondering, um, you know, what levers we do have, do you think we could possibly pull more effectively on that side of it? And I guess this question goes out to sort of the hackney team. Um, Chair, can we come in on the skills um, issue in terms of what we're doing in Hackney as well and just a point on the um, Kensington and Chelsea up, uptake? You can. Uh, I'd be keen for you to answer Councillor Knockers' question, but do do just supplementary. Yeah, go on. Okay, did you want to do that, Adam? I'm answering the question then. Yeah. Do all of it, if you know. I'll answer your question first while it's fresh <laughs> in my head, otherwise I will forget. Um, not a lot of powers at the moment. It's advocacy and it's simplifying the process to make it really clear what people can do. In planning policy terms, your local plan has to be consistent with what the government's saying. So you can't go and put in this kind of really much needed kind of measure or policy. It has to follow what the government is saying. So unless they change, we can't force people to do anything. But our approach of making things clearer, advocating for it, for retrofitting, ensuring that it's really tied into the planning process when an application comes in, it at least means that the applicant is considering what is needed within that. So, okay. Um, RBKC, Local List of Voter Consent Order, I spent a long time going through their website. I can find one application for one. Um, historically, I'm going to run the impression there is no. Sorry, say that again. You the Local List of Voter Consent Order with our. With Kensington and Chelsea, you need to put in a discharge and condition application to the local planning authority. So you've not automatically got them. So you still need to give details to the planning authority. So there should be a record online. I can only find one record. So I don't think the uptake on it has been huge. It's a lot of, a lot of publicity, but there aren't a lot of solar panels being installed. So are you saying you don't think local listed building consent orders are a way forward for creating these markets? They could be, but I think. The RBKC, Local List of Building Consent Order, has often been celebrated, but isn't actually achieving what it was designed to do. It's if not, it's not working, yes. what would you have instead? I think... Sorry to abuse the chair, but this is sorry. very important. We need to understand what, led, what needs to change or whether we're using the powers we've got effectively. I understand. I think they work really well on things like double glazing. I think it's an issue by issue. I think a double glazing, Local List of Building Consent Order, is much easier because a lot of the windows in Hackney aren't original and they were so badly bomb damaged that there is a real real potential option in there that could work really consistently and make it really clear what what applicants could do our issue is again that we have such a varied building stock so a local list of building consent order is often designed for a very specific type of window for example a very particular type of issue blanket approaches weren't what they were designed for by historic england They've been used by RBKC as a blanket approach, but that's a really unusual way of doing it. Previously, they were for kind of estates of really consistent buildings, not across an entire borough. I think it's actually the references to pattern books of the 19th century in our presentation. So It is true, but they were designed to be even more specific than that. I mean, that is an option, and I think that's why we've got our scoping exercise to look at what could work on, and double glazing is probably it more than solar panels because of our varied roof pitches, for example. Anyway, I digress because I wanted to yes, talk sorry. about skills. Well, we might come back to this within the time. Oh, um, upskilling team. Um, so there's been quite a lot of work over the last couple of years to ensure that the planning service has this retrofit knowledge as well. All the conservation officers have gone on this um, traditional building retrofit course, looking at pre-19, kind of 19 buildings, to know what, what can be achieved, what can be done on them. We have a passive house designer within our conservation and urban design sustainability team as well. There is quite a lot of knowledge and that is then disseminated out throughout the planning service at fairly regular meetings. Okay, thank you. Now, we have some quite further questions. Penny, Councillor Root and then Councillor Smith. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to um, talk a bit more about the whole building approach. 
Um, I can absolutely see why it's important, but I also feel that um, whether it be a commercial business or uh, an individual private homeowner, it's a bit frightening because it sort of just implies you've got to think about the whole house. And as we know, whether it be a company or, or an individual homeowner, you tend to do what you can afford to do at any particular time. And I wonder how much guidance we can give owners and businesses in if how they can stagger their approach, if you see what I mean. Um, and if that's something that we're looking to do, because I think, um, I think people could be really put off by retrofitting and quite frightened by it. And one way of helping them to do it is to sort of take them through, hold their hands a little bit. And I wonder if there's any of that has been happening already in, in Westminster. Um, and my other question really is a bit about the, the conservation legislation. As I understand it, conservation legislation tends to concentrate on materials very heavily. And to, so for example, when you're talking about um, replacing double gla windows with double glazing, insisting that they wouldn't, um, which may not necessarily be the most um, environmentally friendly approach. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert on windows, but, um, but certainly if you're looking at things like slates, um, having insisting on original slate rather than um, some of the modern alternatives isn't always helpful. So I just wonder what your impression is about in, in, with the conservation legislation, the balance between aesthetics and materials and whether or not that's a good balance or if there's really scope for the government in thinking about climate change and what we need to do to equip our buildings if they really do need to have a look at that balance again. Whole building approach while well, I think about that one first. Um, it, retrofit measures can be done individually, but it's about having that retrofit plan. So you have that whole building. The issue is if you do some retrofit measures, there are consequences. So you put internal wall insulation, there may be consequences about breathability of the building. If you seal your building, it may not breathe. They're designed to breathe. So it's ensuring that you end up with a healthy building as well as one that people want to live in and is sustainable in the long term. So it's having that plan to understand what the consequences. There's a, a sustainable traditional building alliance have a guidance wheel and within that they outline what the issues, what the technical issues are, what the heritage concerns could be and what the energy concerns are. So that we'll hopefully be sharing with applicants on the website so they can really understand if they do one thing, what the potential issues could be as a result of that. So that's why we've always advocated the whole house approach. And within that, you advocate on dealing with the fabric first. It's to ensure that you're kind of making it a sustainable building. You're lowering your energy uses initially before you're going to, let's say, add lots of solar panels on it. So it's that easier way. Conservation area legislation and a focus on materials. Um, let's see, with conservation areas, you're focusing on the character and appearance of the area. So it's ensuring that applications, when they do come forward, preserve what's special, what's of interest within that area. And that can be the material. So let's say you're in a conservation area, brick buildings, timber windows, slate roofs. That's what's special about it. And often, let's say with UPVC versus timber, timber will last, timber is repairable. A UPVC window has a lifespan of, let's say, 20, 25 years, and then it will need replacing again. Once a timber window has a tiny bit of rot, that can be repaired, whereas a UPVC, UPVC window can't be repaired. So conservation can be sustainable too in the long term, but it's about regular maintenance with it rather than an off-the-shelf replacement. And then we move on to the next one. Thank you. Next question is Councillor Smith. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask this your Hackney team about the local development orders, because I think it's a really good approach that you're taking in Westminster on that estate. Have we done any of that here? And would you be up for looking into that? Because I think it's, I, it sounds to me that that's a really powerful way to go in order to kind of circumvent some of the regulation around, you know, traditional planning. That's the first question. And a simple one for you guys. Um, how effective is the EPC rating at measuring energy efficiency? OK, Hackney, please answer Councillor Smith's first question. Thank you. Um, 
No, we haven't done a great deal of work thinking about local development orders yet. Um, I think this is where our shared knowledge works, so sharing knowledge throughout London. So if Westminster to do their local development order, it can help set the framework so we can see six months on how successful it's being to ensure that we are putting our fairly limited resources in the right approach rather than doing something that may not be successful. So it's a matter of learning from what other local authorities are doing before we necessarily emulate that now. Yeah. yeah. EPCs. <laughs> um, so I think I think there's a there's a kind of acknowledgement that EPCs are now being asked to do a job that they were never intended to do. They were they were there to kind of understand how I suppose um, <clears throat> the, the cost of energy as a, to a property. And they were sort of devised almost as part of a you know kind of like buying and selling property really. Uh, but they've now been kind of used as this metric, which is kind of assessing how effective, uh, how efficient a building is, before how energy efficient a building is performing. And in fact, they've kind of, you know, like grants for retrofitting now will often be based around delivering an EPC of, you know, moving it from an E to a C or something like that. Um, but, it, you know, I think it, the whole EPC rating is being reviewed at the moment. Um, I know our housing team who are doing retrofits on their social housing which they have to they get grant funded and they have to at the moment go from an epc whatever it is to an epcc they're aware that this is all changing but they have to work within the grants they've got but what they're really aiming at is to sort of target a net zero approach because epc will change and it will be much more about how much energy the building actually uses you know because you have these bizarre scenarios where you know you you move from a an electric system to a gas system and you can actually improve your EPC and it just doesn't make any sense. So um, it's going to change and uh, for the, but I, it's used, but I think there's an acknowledgement that it's not the right metric to be using to really understand how, how, you, how you're reducing the carbon demand on the building. Okay. Thank you. Um, and building and renovation passports have been mentioned. Do you know what they are? Do you think that that would be a better measure and drive building improvements over time better than this this EP because I think there's a weakness there with the EPC stuff. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I know about renovation passports. I know about materials passports and under and uh, understanding the whole carbon story of a product essentially. Um, and so, if you're kind of developing a project, um, building a scheme, you would. The whole concept of the materials passport is that you understand where every material comes from and you know its carbon footprint in effect um so i think there's there's a lot of interest in developing that i'm not sure i, I may not know enough to know whether there's a renovation passport system as well thank you chair <laughs> Thank you. Really, really helpful. Um, I just wanted to very briefly ask about going back a little bit on the topic of improving guidance so, um, and understanding that also it can be quite off-putting if not clear enough um, and encouraging uptake for residents, business and other properties. I feel that an area that will be really beneficial to learn too is the impact of health and its benefits. Um, I just wonder, it might not even be your team, think, looking at the Hackney team, but also here perhaps from your experience. Is this data that is being collected? It might not even be your team, but it will be, I think, quite beneficial for people to understand and also feel encouraged and, uh, and learn more and see what it is for them to, well, hopefully it will. <laughs> Thank you. I'll make a start on that. But I think it just goes back to the, um, the point that um, Councillor Rout was making earlier around, um, you know, not putting residents and businesses off and being able to kind of explain the benefits and the technical details in a really easy to understand way. And I think actually Westminster do that very well on their website. And I think that's something that, as, as I said earlier, we're looking to introduce very soon. Um, I think the question was around um, just communicating the health benefits as well, which I think is also really important. Um, I guess it's kind of the, the energy costs as well and the impact that has on the cost of living. 
Um, is there anything in particular you wanted to add? Um, so I think the answer is yes, that's something that we could look at in terms of um, updating our website and uh, explaining what can be done in non-technical terms, but also the benefits of the various measures. Thank you. Councillor Root. Um, again, in terms of helping local people to retrofit, have you considered um, some kind of a list of approved contractors and that kind of thing to, to, to help people? Because again, it's that being worried about the cowboy and also you know, a lot of homeowners will, they'll get a little bit of work done and they get a builder and they say, have you thought about this? Before you know it, they're going down a whole different route. And I just wonder if, if you've considered anything like that for suppliers and builders, et cetera. Um, the other thing I was just going to ask as well was, was the task force that's in Westminster. Is that something that we've thought about here, particularly because it does appear that, that you know, the, there may be the possibility of some external funding to help to pay for it, which is always a possible <laughs> welcome at the moment. Um, so is it something we might consider here? Um, I think it's it's something that we can't do in terms of recommending um, various trade people, um, unfortunately. Um, it's, yeah, that's, that's quite a tricky one. We, you know, we've been asked in the past around kind of recommending um, various um, you know, architects or builders or other trades people. And just as an organisation, that's not something that we can do. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the task force, um, I think it's a funding issue, but it's also about thinking around, um, you know, how to spend funds. And as I said, we, as I said earlier, we've kind of devoted our kind of focus towards the London Council's program um, and how we kind of work collaboratively. So kind of that's where we feel we're getting kind of best value for um, available um, budget at the moment. Um, note the point around available funding that's something that we'll continue to scope out and obviously there's a resource implication in itself in kind of a, a bidding for um, funds um, and you know that's obviously there's no guarantee of being successful so it's just kind of balancing kind of um, you know um, finite resources with what we think is going to deliver the best um, outcomes. Professor Potter. I've just got to follow on in terms of to West to Westminster in terms of what I mean um, Council Root sorry was talking about in terms of you know approved contractors you seem to have found a way around this through the hub of people sharing knowledge about you know recommended contractors so is that have you found a way of doing that and generating that conversation and that kind of local reassurance in terms of skilled you know um skilled personnel and, and firms you know that enables you know you know the works to go forward and strengthens the local skills uh, sorry as well no it's a really good question and i we've grappled with this as well because when we're talking about the concept of a retrofit procurement club what we'd love to do is just to say these are trusted tradespeople that you should be able to use as retrofit installers but we're again in, not in a position to do that as the council but it doesn't mean that we're not exploring avenues with partners so the national retrofit hub has um six working groups and their first working groups is i think called warm healthy homes um and i think it's uh, dr khan who's leading that working group is from uh is it trademark the trust mark um and basically, we're looking at how we, the council, or as we, the retrofit task force, could be the conduit to connect people, but without kind of the legal implications of making recommendations to trusted tradespeople. So it, it hasn't formalized itself as a procurement club at the moment. It's these kind of mini pilot projects that we've described through the various work streams this evening. Um, it's, it's quite com complex, to be honest. Um, so looking at how we knowledge share without liability as well um, is something that we're having to grapple with. But again, it's all kind of a, a trial and error process at the moment. You know, it's it's pilot projects. It's in that kind of stage. Um, if I 
may I go back to an, another question that I think wasn't that I think we could contribute to. I think it was Councillor Root. You were asking about how um, you can make a case for whole house retrofit, and I think that's a really good question and something that we should come back to. But our housing team um, developed an energy saving show home in a terrace block up quite close to the Queen's Park estate, I think, in the northwest of the borough. And basically they did a deep retrofit of a basement flat in order to show other, um, actually the purpose was mostly tradespeople and local authorities to show how we had done a deep retrofit on on a property that you know is, is um, prolific across London. We also have commissioned and done in-house how-to guides, which are for more for residential um, property owners to look at how they could install air source heat pumps and, and PVs. But again, these are um, freely available resources on our website that could, you know, could be shared across Hackney for sure. And I think that's the the stewardship vehicle that we're trying to encourage. It's like it's not all councils doing all things at sharing across councils because there are some there's some low hanging fruit and some easy wins and if we've already done those how to guides i don't see why you couldn't share them and we 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 pick and choose what we steal from other boroughs as well so uh, i i totally understand that and i totally understand that there is a lot of difference around typologies and so forth right but um i am quite clear that we always have more in common and there is an ability to be able to systematize the transformation of our building stock more effectively than is being done at the moment. I would like some clarity from the officers and indeed from Guy in front of us today about what you could do with the current powers to be more systematic about that retrofit, about the rules, the planning stuff, because there's technology there's skills there's finances all of those kind of things what about the planning rules you've cut planning powers we've currently got could be used to do that more efficiently more effectively more systematically and secondly if you don't think you've got the powers then what needs to change i can have a start at answering that um one of, one of the difficulties, Westminster, and I'm sure Hackney, own property, manage it, look after it. It's probably a small percentage of the buildings that are in your, your area. Um, so we can't make people retrofit uh, through planning. Um, and we certainly can't do anything about, we have to work with people who are private owners of property to try and encourage them to retrofit. Um, there's no stick in terms of making them do it. I mean, there's, there is stuff, if you like, about minimum energy, you know, uh, energy, energy efficiency meets, standards, yeah. standards and stuff like that, which isn't necessarily a planning issue, but it, it, it exists and maybe forces them into a planning world. But it's very much for, for what we've been trying to do is more, if planning is a perceived barrier, then can we get out of the way where we can without while still fulfilling all the appropriate functions that we need to do? Um, but if the stuff that we can do to, to incentivize, then great. Um, in terms of policy, uh, we are we are doing a partial city plan review, and one of the policies is a retrofit first policy, which is trying to incentivize and encourage that approach. Um, so it almost making it more difficult to demolish than to look at re a retrofit scheme. So there's a policy framework that we're developing. That policy is also looking at, is there any way one can incentivize? So, uh, you know, were one to come forward with a scheme which was a full build retrofit, really fantastic credentials around the energy performance of the retrofitted building, how might that play into the balance of what they want to do? Like I, th I think I touched upon this before, if they wanted an extra story or an extra two stories, but it, it was part of a, a very compelling retrofit story. Might the policy change to be a bit more effectively encouraging of that form of development? It's not something that is policy, it's something they might explore and they would have to go through consultation. So, you know, that's something that might happen down the line, but at the moment it isn't. I believe, I'm a bit, I, 
I've, we, we talked about this in, um, it could have been one of the National Retrofit uh, Hub events that I went to, and it was about kind of, if somebody wants to come forward with a planning proposal, you have to in, require them to do other things to make uh, the building perform better. Um, it was called consequential improvements is the way they termed it in the discussion that I listened into. Um, and apparently, um, maybe planners in the room might know, understand this better, but it, it, it was it, what it, beca it became known as the conservatory tax, where you wanted to put a conservatory on your building and that's all you wanted to do, but you were being asked to do X, Y, and Z. And it, it, it legally was, uh, there was holes all over it. So it, it fell away. Whether one can look at it again, I don't know. But, uh, and whether there is a way to sort of, as I say, if, if somebody is coming forward with a, with a compelling retrofit scheme, can you make, you know, is there a planning environment whereby what they're doing is supported um, because, because, because it has those register, i.e. giving greater weight to the climate change. And the new MPPF in, in December has introduced a new paragraph which is specifically saying give greater weight in your planning decisions to schemes which are bringing forward energy efficiency uh, measures. Which might be a start. Hackney, what do you think? I'll start and Adam's going to chip in. Um, so I think most of the, as Adam kind of said in his presentation, most of the retrofit of um, stock within the borough doesn't actually require planning permission. Um, but a large proportion of our stock is those historic buildings where, you know, you need to take that whole um, kind of building approach. So I think um, the, the work that we are going to be doing with providing that guidance on the website is, is key. Um, I think to see kind of real change, there needs to be the financial incentives for homeowners to then do the work. And I think that's the big thing that, that should be lobbied for. Um, in terms of what we can do for um, the um, developments that, that do require permission, um, I think um, what we be looking at is, um, is guidance. Um, I think in terms of getting the most effective, um, cost effective and um, best outcomes, having that regional approach based on those typologies that Adam referred to earlier is probably the way to go and pooling our resources and continuing to work across London um, with, with London councils. Um, so going down that particular route, um, Adam, do you want to add to that? And, um, the government actually released a really helpful report last week, uh, Adapting Historic Homes for Energy Efficiency, a review of the barriers. It identified five barriers, and they were the planning system, local authority skills, training and capacity, guidance and information for homeowners and occupiers, construction industry skills, training and capacity, and affordability and financial incentives. And I think we've, you know, we've covered so many of these issues here. We know there's a skill shortage. We know that there's no, you know, they're really expensive, these measures, they're needed, but they are expensive. There's no, as Tom was saying, carrot to force anyone to do it or to encourage you. And although there is, you know, a plethora of guidance, there's so much guidance out there. So you put retrofit building into Google, as a homeowner, you wouldn't know where to start. And it's always making more guidance makes that harder because where do you go? Hence why that regional government, local authority, London plan or London council led approach may be a better one. And the planning system, it got some really interesting paragraphs saying that planning was raised as a consistent issue, but actually it wasn't the main issue. It wasn't the main significant barrier to the installation of energy efficiency measures. But the planning system does need to be streamlined. It does need to be a bit clearer across councils to ensure that we are all being consistent with each other as well. So it's not a matter of one person in Islington getting this, a different approach in Hackney. And we do try as conservation officers, as planners to meet other boroughs three, four times a year to ensure that we are being consistent and interpreting the legislation in the same way within that. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, we're running over time. Councillor Root, and I've got one last question, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, it's just a sort of leading on from what you're saying. I mean, it does seem to me that um, encouraging people to do things, um, the more local that you can be, the, the better it is. 
And to some extent, actually, sometimes if it's ordinary people who've done certain things, who are passing on their knowledge and their experience and their contacts, that could be even more valuable sometimes. Um, I just wonder if there's any scope as a local authority to, to sort of have some sort of network of people who have invested a lot of time and energy in retrofitting, whether it be a, a commercial or a domestic property, and, and sort of using that as a knowledge base for putting other people in touch with them so that we as a, as a council, can we can't have lists of approved contractors and what have you, but we can have lists of people who are willing to share their experience of doing retrofitting with others because a lot of these people are doing it partly because they're very com committed environmentally and they do want to spread the knowledge. And I just wonder if that's something that we might be able to do as a local authority to encourage that. thing to my what i've interpreted that to mean is having a network led shared with the local authority with other people interested in the same thing so it may be yes i think that would be possible i think it would i'm not quite sure what framework it would take but it would be possible um we're also working with the hackney society so maybe they could also work on that and we're doing a talk in february on climate change and adapting your traditional buildings as well I'd like to finally, the last question to um, Rachel from Lynch. Having been on the other side of this, what will you do to improve the planning application process when you are trying to do something as ambitious as you, as you have done with a building as old and as unique as the one that you have been dealing with? I think we've, we've got off to a really good start and we've had a really engaged conservation officer, which is brilliant because without having those early conversations about what might be possible, you just don't know which direction you're going in before you put the application in. So I think um, it's been super helpful to have input from Adam and Claire Brady at Historic England. Um, I think the advice has recently changed from Hackney about something, for example, windows. The previous developer put single glazed windows in, timber replacement windows, um, and they're sort of historically pretty correct but then we, we're actually having to get rid of them and retro you know basically replace them with with a new double glazed timber window that looks exactly the same but is double glazed so short changes in policy you know this building's kind of caught in the middle of that because quite a lot of money was already recently spent on it but most of the things that were done were done wrong so we're having to sort of address that in this in this phase of work um so that's that's a sort of interesting thing it's, it's great that it's moving in the right direction and i think the, the historic England guidance that recently came out is really clear as well i think that's super helpful for architects and planners um just on the affordability because of the because the costs are so high it's not strictly related to planning but we've noticed how much of a difference it it, it makes to the clients and their decision making when the energy efficiency measures if you're buying a system that's zero percent vat rated and on this project they're lucky because it's mainly five it's mainly going to be five percent vat because it's a new residential dwelling but i think it would be incredible to lobby for retrofit measures generally on whole house retrofits to be 0% VAT because the difference that makes to homeowners is massive. And that's without giving people money, it take, you know, it just cuts how much they have to spend. So things like that for homeowners are probably would make the difference between doing it or not doing it. And I think all the, all the measures that you've discussed about the, the, the areas where you, you know, you've relaxed the permitted development sound brilliant and very much kind of in tune with the current um, policies from Historic England as well. So thank you very much, Rachel. I'm going to call, um, draw this discussion to a close. It's been extremely useful and very insightful. Thank you very much for all of our contributors. I'm sorry we didn't get to ask you anything, uh, Guy, but we did get a lot of detail from a lot of different perspectives. So I think it has been very helpful for us to be able to draw some uh, conclusions and make some recommendations um, in the future. Uh, I'm going straight to item six. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, minutes of the previous meeting are to follow, so we haven't, haven't got any to uh, to approve 
um, this evening. Uh, then we have a brief conversation about the work programme. Well, I know we discussed it a bit earlier in the pre-meet. Is there anything people would like to say now about the work programme going forward? Sorry. Um, sorry, I need to release the guests. Thank you very much for being here. I forget. Sometimes I forget. I suppose you're so enthusiastic about being here. Fair. Yeah, key thing is uh, the 21st of February, we're taking evidence from Hackney Light and Power. Um, and then on the 20th of March, we've got the Council of Corporate Properties and Library of Things. That is, of course, then the end of the municipal year. So if you're already starting to think about things that are not on this agenda now, we need to start gathering them as a commission in order to be able to make them make them as draft recommendations that Tracy can put a new commission in May. Um, but uh, that, is the, uh, that is the work programme as we've currently got it outlined in front of us. So we're all happy with that. Great, lovely. Um, and then finally, do we have any other business? No? Then I declare this meeting closed. Thank you very much, everybody. See you again soon.